Right now, there's two bodies. One's in Washington, one's in Augusta. So there's two. But they're trying to look at now, don't you agree that if the governor stopped vetoing these things, they wouldn't have to worry about having these things done in the cities and towns. We would be doing it at the state level the way you want it. You said there's eight bills there, but none of them are passed. Last year, he vetoed everything. So until he starts doing that, you have the cities and towns have no alternative, Councilor, but to make their own laws. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Montgomery? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to start using the three minute clock. Anyone else that wishes to testify in favor of LD 1361? Will the department be subject to the three minute clock? I, we heard from yes. the bill sponsor, we heard from the governor's office. Thank you. Senator Volk and Representative Herbig and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Labor, Commerce, Research, and Economic Development. My name is Julie Rabinowitz, and I'm the Director of Communication and Operations for the Maine Department of Labor. And I'm here to testify in support of LD 1361, an act to promote minimum wage consistency. LD 1361 seeks to prohibit a municipality or any other political subdivision of the state from enacting an ordinance governing the minimum wage that an employer must pay an employee. The department fully supports LD 1361 as wage and hour laws can be confusing for many employees and employers. When trying to dissect the laws for clarity about the rights of employees regarding such matters as the minimum wage and the recovery of unpaid wages, many employers and employees become frustrated. Further expansion to a third jurisdictional tier, federal, state, and city, will only complicate these matters. One of the most common areas in Maine where both employees and employers misinterpret the law is with the payment of the minimum wage. This can include standard minimum wage violations and final or missed payroll. In the prior 12 months, the Bureau of Labor Standards Wage and Hour Division has had more than 300 minimum wage violations reported, finding only 112 complaints to be valid. This means that the department spent time investigating two-thirds of complaints only to find no violation. According to the U.S. Department of Labor's website, there were close to 50 reported violations with findings in Maine under their jurisdiction. We provide these statistics in, in an effort to show that the more minimum wage authority you provide, in other words, the higher minimum wage paid in that jurisdiction, the greater the complaint intake process. In workers' rights cases, such as wage and hour or workplace safety complaints, the jurisdiction almost always falls to the authority that offers the most protection for the worker. In the case of wages, it falls to the jurisdiction with the highest, highest minimum wage that can be enforced. The state can only enforce the minimum wage in state statute. If LD 1361 does not pass and a municipality, for example, were to increase their minimum wage, all of these cases that fall within a municipality or other political subdivision would now be under the jurisdiction of that public entity to enforce. The regulations that provide the greatest protections prevail in an enforcement action. Neither the state nor the federal wage and hour divisions would enforce the other public entity's higher minimum wage requirements. Enforcement would fall to the local authority mandating the highest minimum wage, including the taking of complaints, the conduct of investigations of complaints for and, and of investigations of complaints, and focused enforcement, and the enforcement to include taking the employer to court. Employees who work in the local areas who contact the state to file a complaint about their employer would be referred by the state to the local enforcement agency. The department would also like to mention that employers will still be liable for all record-keeping and poster requirements under federal, state, and municipalities or other political subdivisions. This would now mean three sets of minimum wage posters to be posted and updated accordingly. In addition, employers must ensure that their record-keeping meets the highest standards between the three enforcement entities. Employers would also have the responsibility to ensure that the highest wage is paid based on the location of the work performed. For example, 
An employee who works within a city for one day, but outside the city on other days, employers would be required to break down the rates of pay per jurisdictional requirements. Again, the rate of pay is determined based on where the work is performed, not where the employee's home base is or the location of the employer's headquarters. If a company's headquarters are in the town with a higher minimum wage, those workers would be subject to the local minimum, but workers for the same company who work in the next town over or who work on the other side of the state would be subject to the state minimum wage for the performance of the same work. This is for Yes. Yeah, I think it's just that we get the three-minute clock. Okay. Ago, so uh, thank you. There are several other issues that the testimony addresses in terms of jurisdictional responsibilities and enforcement complications. Okay. Thank you Thanks. very much. Any questions from the committee? Yes, Thank you, Madam Chair. I, mean, I have questions today. Uh, how did the Department of Labor testify on the minimum wage bills that we heard before the committee a few weeks ago? We were opposed to raising the minimum wage bills. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we could just uh, take it down in here. That would be appreciated. Thank you. I want to respect everyone. Um, yes, Representative Gilbert, then represents Texas. Thank okay. you. So, you, Mr. Benowitz, you mentioned that there were. 300 minimum wage violations were recorded. Complaints right. that we investigated. And then uh, the municipality, the one who provides the highest minimum wage would be the one responsible for dealing with those? Conducting the investigation, yes. So that could reduce the number of investigations that the state would have if you have two or three of our largest towns were to hire a minimum wage, they would be the ones responsible for taking care of them. They would be responsible, but there is also would be confusion for the worker because they may call the state and then we would have to tell them they have to call the municipality. There also may be confusion because this would only be in uh, minimum wage, overtime, and final pay violations or investigations, not in things like leave, child labor, uh, and some of the other things that are under the wage and hour investigation. So what we would find is that, and this is part of what my testimony addressed, would be that workers might be confused and call the municipality and then have to be referred for their leave questions or their child lab labor questions to the state. But if they call the state about their local minimum wage issues, then they have to be referred to the municipality, so, so there will so, be So if I confusion. worked in a town that I had a higher minimum wage and I had a complaint and I called the Department of Labor about it yes. and they would say, where did you work? And I'd say, in the town with the higher minimum wage, how long does it take for the state to say, you need to call the town that you worked in? That's not right. Okay. Yes, no, exactly. I think I, I doesn't do, take very long. No, it doesn't, but the worker might be uh, annoyed that they have to make another phone call. Oh, represent Sekis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what you were saying earlier, if a uh, if a company is based in the municipality that that uh, that has a higher mandated wage, but they have satellite offices or maybe say it's a telecom business or, or a medical business where you have people that are on the road. If they're not working within that higher mandated wage municipality, right. they would actually get paid differently than the yeah. other person so within that company the, that's working within that municipality. Exactly. So let's take the example of a home health care agency where their headquarters are in Bangor, but um, the worker works exclusively in, say, Hancock or Washington County. Those workers who work uh, visiting uh, and caring for patients in Hancock and Washington would be paid at the state minimum wage, while the workers in the headquarters uh, in Bangor would be paid whatever the municipal wage would be in Bangor. Representative Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, we've heard a whole host of uh, wage mandate bills coming before this committee this, uh, this session. I know that one of them had to do with tipped employees. Yes. Do you see that tipped employees might be affected by this situation a little differently? Right, and this is an example where the, the different jurisdictions uh, between overlap between federal law and state law. So right now the tip credit is $3.75. It's half the minimum wage. That's a statewide tip credit. 
The federal TIP credit is actually uh, $2.93, I think. And so um, the federal TIP credit is the difference um, that the, the employer has to, would have to make up the difference between the federal TIP credit under federal law and the federal minimum wage, which is $5.12. The state TIP credit cannot exceed the federal TIP credit. So, so right now ours is 375. It's half of the minimum wage. If a municipality were to raise their minimum wage to excess of 375, or excuse me, to to make the difference greater than five dollars and twelve cents. So, say raising the minimum wage over ten dollars. Um, the employer, the state would have to raise that tip credit. The tip credit cannot exceed five dollars and twelve cents. I know this is it's it's complicated to explain, but but basically we would have to adjust whatever the the municipality would have to have language in their statute that addresses the tip credit to ensure that they are not in turn violating um, the federal tip credit requirement. Uh, I tried to follow all that. Sorry. I think we may need to go through that again. I can only Labor speed, imagine sorry. It might be like the businesses. Um, a lot of what you do, I know when we visit your office, we talk a lot about our region education and how you work a lot with workers and a lot with employers. Is that going to impact the amount of effort you're going to have to, uh, to put towards that? Right, so for example, we have information about the minimum wage on our website. We would have to put links to the different municipalities and hope that they have additional further information on their websites. There would have to be a, a third poster developed for each municipality. And that in and of itself is confusing to workers. Um, you know, which poster is the one I'm supposed to read, which, which is the one that, that governs me. So the, those municipalities would be required to do all of, of that outreach and education materials, both for the worker side and for the employer side, as well as the reporting requirements. And as you know, the Department of Labor does a lot of reporting about wages um, and violations, equal pay and so forth, and investigations. Um, we would not be tracking that data any longer, so our reporting to you on the statewide level would be incomplete unless there were uh, some requirement to make those municipalities either keep those records as well or report that data to the department. So all those kinds of things would need to be addressed. Representative Campbell, then Representative Gilbert, then Senator Goldberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don't you think that the federal government and the state of Maine can make laws that will say Mayor Brennan can't run his city down in Portland without worrying about the help from uh, the state? That he's a big enough boy to serve him when he's a state senator. So don't you think that he's capable, if he's an elected mayor, of running the city of Portland, as well as our chief executive is running the state of Maine? Well, as, as also outlined in, in later in my testimony that he didn't get to address, the, the municipalities have a lot of codes that they're already struggling to enforce. Health care, uh, health codes, restaurant inspections, fire codes, safety codes, this would require another level of enforcement. And the issue with this code is that, or, or this level of, of ordinance, is it affects people's paychecks. If you're waiting for your final paycheck, this, the city cannot delay in that investigation. So it requires a level of investment of every municipality to make sure that the law is enforced. And that's what we're concerned about. We are a small state, we have, our, even our biggest cities are, are considered small on a national scale. And that's a level of additional burdens, burden and regulation. The taxpayers of Maine are already paying for this service statewide, and this would be a duplicative service at the municipal level to have the municipal workers take that on. Uh, wage and hour inspectors run fully burdened about $80,000 a position, and they would need to have enough to do that work and to cover for vacations and sick time and those other kinds of things. It's, it's a significant investment for the municipality. Representative Gilbert. Thank you, Madam Chair. You mentioned uh, two or three times about a confusion in posters as to what the minimum wage was. We have a federal minimum wage now, and we have a state minimum wage. 
Does the department get very many questions as to or concerns that that confuse what as to what the minimum wage? There's a lot of confusion about wages, and in particular, as it relates to overtime and exemptions from overtime, well, and that is part of the minimum wage. Seven twenty-five to seven fifty. Yes. We have people violating the minimum wage right now, which means that there's confusion about what they're supposed to be paying their workers. That's, they're not paying. Right. Uh, we, I, we know I, people I, are violating the law. That, that, that I don't necessarily agree. The other, the other thing is this: this is not a bill to promote minimum wage consistency. I look at because there's no law now. I look at it as they want to prevent a municipal uh, government from establishing their own minimum wage. I'm wondering how the state would feel if the feds came in and said, well, you know, the New England region has all these different, each state has their own minimum wage. What would you feel if the state, if the feds came in and said, well, we're going to put everybody on the federal minimum wage like New Hampshire for New England? That would affect five other states just for consistency. But it would be a violation of the Tenth Amendment. Well. So we have a constitutional issue. I mean, this is well, legal. We, we, it's constitutional. This, is, this might be, there may be a difference here but it's still taking a right away from municipalities that they now have. That's how I feel. And we do have some cases where uh, U.S. DOL preempts the state law in terms of wage and hour enforcement, and we defer to them. Okay. And they have jurisdiction. Thank you. Oh, Senator Volk, then Representative Stekis, then Representative Ward. Okay. Representative Stekis, then Representative Ward. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, just trying, just trying to picture this on the municipal level. Uh, the municipality would have to basically develop their own labor department. It sounds like okay. And from what we're talking about, they're going to have to pay for it. Yes. Okay. So, so taxpayers from around the state will not pay for it. That municipality. Is there some other mechanism other than raising the property taxes in that municipality to be able to pay for that? Not to my knowledge. It would have to come out of this city or town budget. Thank you. That works out for Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we are the Labor Committee, so anytime anybody has an idea about how to change how we handle labor in the state, it comes before us. And we've had bills uh, having to do with uh, family medical leave, uh, child labor, prevailing wages, uh, vacation pay, break pay, things like that. Now, let's say uh, different. Let's say Portland comes up with their own minimum wage. How, you know, if we have those issues coming up, and those those workers have have a complaint, have do they also go to the new municipal labor department now, or who's going to handle all that stuff? No, and that's part of the confusion. So they would still be calling the State Department of Labor, but I think that often what happens is that the person who's <coughs> mandating your overtime final paychecks and your minimum wage, you would naturally think to call them about your other wage and hour issues. So those would be the people who would then be referred to call the state. So we'd have people call in the city and we'd tell them to call the state, and we'd have people call in the state and we'd tell them to call the city. <coughs> well, thank you. Several. Um, I would think that it's possible people would even be confused by the fact that they live in one municipality and work in another municipality. Correct. So that might even cause confusion. Correct. And we see that right now with the um, uh, ordinances legalizing marijuana in particular jurisdictions that um, it, it's legal while you're in there, but when you leave there and you go to work the next day, you know, there's confusion about where the line is, um, and if you work uh, the next town over, but you live in, say, Portland, but you work in Westbrook or Scarborough, um, you would not be subject to Portland's minimum wage. Any other Representative Campbell. You just mentioned marijuana. 
Marijuana, you just mentioned marijuana. I did, I did. Marijuana is illegal. It is illegal. And they, they, they say it's illegal in, in uh, Portland, but talk to the police, it's a different story. The bottom line, the federal government said it's illegal, and it's illegal in this whole country. And that's an example where federal law has preempted local law. Seeing no further questions for Ms. Benowitz, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to testify in favor of LD 1361? Mm -hmm. Just so that so the is aware, how many people do we have testifying in favor? Okay, and then how many in opposition? Okay. Thank you. And just uh, so opponents are aware, we will be giving an unlimited amount of time to one representative and then using the three minute clock, just as we did for the group. I'm very excited. Well, thank you. 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 Well, yes. Senator Volk, Representative Herbig, and distinguished members of the Labor, Commerce, Research, and Economic Development Committee. My name is Greg Dougal, and I'm here today representing the Maine Restaurant Association, the Maine Innkeepers Association, in support of LD 1361. As somebody who has spent a fair amount of time in towns and cities around the state in relation to multiple issues, including minimum wage, I can assure you that this approach to governing is not sustainable. We can, cannot continue to have a separate set of standards in every community, potentially in conflict with state law. I understand the concern and angst associated with no minimum wage increase over an extended period of time, which has led to individual communities taking their own initiative. We truly believe that minimum wage increases should be reviewed and incorporated at the federal and state level. There are many issues with the local approach for businesses, including what you've heard, continuity from community to community, that operate in multiple jurisdictions, enforcement by individual towns without the appropriate resources, which could lead to unnecessary prosecutions and additional reporting requirements set forth by these new ordinances. Main small businesses are now put in a position of having to adhere to three sets of rules in three jurisdictions when administering their labor policies. The other issue that seems to be manifesting itself, and certainly the most important one for me, are citizen initiatives proposing extreme minimum wages. This bill, if passed, would not allow for these types of actions to occur in communities that are ill-equipped to handle the enormity of a minimum wage referendum and potential ordinance or the devastation heaped upon their local businesses by the extreme wage. One person with an idea and 1,500 signatures can destroy many small businesses and eliminate many more jobs looking for an unsustainable wage of $15 per hour. In the case of Portland, once the ordinance is passed, it cannot be touched for five years. Our hope is the committee will agree that it is your role to set wage policy in the state of Maine and not allow for a hodgepodge of local ordinances. Uh, because the state has no preemption statute, we could be facing the specter of the highest minimum wage in the country in the city of Portland with the proposed $15 minimum wage. This is an uns unsustainable wage that will make Portland an outlier, potentially suspend any business development, and definitely will mean a reduction in jobs. Why should one of the smallest cities in the country have the highest minimum wage? I guess the answer is because they can. The Seattle metro area at a whopping $15 per hour has a population of 3.6 million people with 640,000 of them living in Seattle proper. That is 10 times the size of Portland, half the population of the whole state of Maine. The CBO estimates job losses with a $10 minimum wage that the president has proposed to be 500,000 nationwide. What will be the effect on Portland or other Maine cities? And I'd also like to, at the end of my testimony, I kind of refer to this, and I'll do it as quickly as I can, because I don't want to hold anybody up. But in a union environment, there are a series of negotiations between business and labor, culminating with an agreement that the union members vote on. It is not possible for one person to get 50 signatures to support an extremely high wage and then have the workforce vote on it. Union leaders know that all businesses have constraints and can only afford so much. But in the referendum process, there is no such thing. So there are a lot more things to this than just people not being able to you know, balance what it is that they need to do next or the information that goes with it. There's serious implications that could actually drive a lot of people out of business, especially small businesses. So I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Mr. Dugan. Uh, Representative Pecto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Dugal, thank you for being here. How did the Maine Innkeepers Association testify on the minimum wage bills which we heard a couple weeks ago? We testified in opposition to, and so did the Maine Restaurant Association, but you also remember that we had this repartee before. Uh, that was because there were so many bills and it's really pretty hard to see you know, where we're headed. You also know that many of the people that I brought with me were in favor of some sort of change to minimum wage, but not at the local level. Seeing no further questions. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to testify? 
Senator Volt, Representative Herbeck. I'm Chris O'Neill. I'm here representing uh, the Portland Community Chamber of Commerce, one of the oldest running trade organizations in America uh, with about 700 member employers and about 35,000 employees who work in the city of Portland. We've got a little experience with municipal minimum wage activity as of late. First, the chamber has and always will support, generally speaking, the tradition in Maine of home rule. But municipalities should not be in the business of wage regulation. At the Portland Community Chamber, um, we largely consist of small businesses. 73% of them have fewer than 50 employees and almost half have fewer than 10 employees. The chamber is all about prosperity, but we're not all about big business. Small businesses tend to be much more fearful of their flexibility uh, constraints that might happen in uh, a situation where one municipality played against another on wages. About a year ago, when Portland started to talk about raising the minimum wage unilaterally, we took a poll among a membership, and uh, the, the results were, were amazing. We were about three quarters uh, in favor of the minimum wage being raised, either by the federal or the state governments, but uh, by a bigger margin, uh, members said Portland should not go it alone. The primary motivation for that was uh, they didn't want to have to compete uh, all around them with uh, uh, with other businesses that might engage them in a race to the bottom. It's been said that, that the government at the state level and the federal government has uh, failed to act. Uh, and while they have failed to raise the minimum wage, at least in Maine, of late, they have failed to act. Um, disagree or, or agree with how the legislature and the governor have handled uh, this subject matter, but in fact, uh, many of you have voted upon it numerous times in your in your tenures. Municipalities have numerous tools within their toolbox to impact uh, the prosperity and the well-being of not only their residents, but the folks who work within those municipalities. Educate the kids, keep the crime down, uh, get more commer commercial property, uh, bring on more jobs. There's lots of things that municipalities have within their purview uh, that can directly impact uh, the prosperity of individuals. And last, um, Maine, people at, at, at the Portland Chamber at least worry that, that Maine is just uh, too small a town, uh, too small a town, we call it a small town, to be able to handle this sort of disparity. As Mr. Dougal said, uh, that mostly these are, have been very large cities. 80,000 municipalities and, and counties exist in America, about 12 have enacted uh, minimum wages unilaterally, and most of them have been in, uh, very large uh, municipalities or, or, or counties. So we caution against a, a bifurcated approach to this sort of thing. We'd be happy to answer questions if anybody has them. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yes, Representative Fecto, then Representative Campbell. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, those representing the business community spoke largely in opposition to the minimum wage increases, uh, the pieces of legislation before our committee a few weeks ago. Uh, you just said in your testimony that your the, the, the folks that you represent at the chamber in Portland uh, seem to be overwhelmingly in support of a minimum wage increase. So I'm curious as to why you weren't here speaking in favor of it, um, uh, in favor of those bills that day, and do you think that those representing the business community that we heard largely, largely against those bills a few weeks ago were we're not accurately representing the business community, at least possibly in Portland. Did you miss me? No, I, I, uh, the chamber took no position on statewide minimum wage, which is uh, in and of itself uh, a statement. Uh, the, 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 the minimum wage in Portland is essentially irrelevant. Uh, studies that, that came into the Portland, uh, the Portland process that has on, been ongoing for about a year, uh, Maine Center for Economic Policy uh, brought in numbers and uh, if you extrapolate the numbers that they brought in, uh, that they derived through all sorts of portals, DOL, et cetera, um, we can estimate that less than 700 people make less than $10 an hour in Portland, and that less than 200 people make minimum wage in Portland. So uh, for the Chamber's uh, fight in Portland, it's not so much about the dollar amount, uh, but about the principle of, of uh, being an outlier. 
follow up. Uh, so what was the purpose of taking that poll then? I guess I'm confused. Why did you bother to poll your your, your members to find out if they supported the minimum wage or not? Well, it, it, having, having been started as the Board of Trade in the early 1850s, uh, the chambers learned a few things about longevity and, and member uh, loyalty, and that's one of the things that they they do. They engage the membership to uh, to take the pulse of, of uh, where they stand. Portland's a pretty funky community. It's not like uh, that. I would submit to you that the chamber's positions on certain issues, and I represent them a lot at City Hall. The Portland Chamber's positions on many issues wouldn't mirror those of say the no offense to anybody from Prescott Isle, the, the Holton Chamber of Commerce. Oh, Representative Campbell, then Senator Volk. Thank you. Welcome, Chris. How have you been? Well, thanks, Representative. Good to see you. Do you know that we have tomorrow, do you know that we're going to have a work session on five bills to raise the minimum wage? Did you know that? I did. Hopefully, then we will pass something decent and it won't get vetoed on the second floor. In this bill, we won't we have to worry about this. Thank you. I just wondered, um, I was writing down something else, trying to get myself organized here, but I want to write down those statistics that you cited about the number of people earning minimum wage in Portland. I thought that you just said something. I, I thought threw I a flurry of numbers at you. Yeah, you threw that up. I wonder if you could trick, slow that down trick. or submit uh, it and test it. You get those on my paper. Okay, thank you. Representative Stutkus. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question I had earlier about uh, a, a municipality creating their own labor department and having to pay for it themselves. The answer seemed to be most likely the only mechanism they would have would be to raise property taxes. And from the Chamber's point of view in your area, and mine might be a little bit different in rural Maine, but if property taxes were to go up, would the businesses in your uh, organization be more or less likely to expand their business or more or less likely to create more jobs or more or less likely to pay higher wages if their property taxes were to rise? Representative, I don't think we need to take a poll of our membership to get the answer to that, but you bring, bring up a good point, and that is that, that uh, one of the issues that we have found in Portland, and it might also happen in, in uh, less robust communities, I mean, Portland's got uh, a 300 plus million dollar a year budget. It's one of the biggest enterprises in Maine. Um, and the business community there is fearful that in trying to enforce wage and hour laws that uh, the city could drop the ball. The city is under considerable pressure, as is most city in, in, in Maine, uh, to educate the kids, to keep the streets clean, to pay for the cops. And um, yeah, the city drops the ball on that. We don't really have a whole lot of doubt that, uh, particularly with the private cause of action included in the, or the proposed ordinance, we don't have a lot of doubt that it'll be the courts who settle these things. And, and that's, that's where the enforcement lab is in the courts. You want to throw a wet blanket on business, do that. In the, in the, le in the last year or however long it's been that this conversation has been going on in the city, has there been much mention of how they're going to pay for their own labor department? No. Thank you. Seeing no further questions from the committee, thank you. Hello again. Curtis Picard, Executive Director of the Retail Association of Maine. I can't add much more to what folks have already said. I have a couple quick points. One is the way our members look at this is it's really a rural versus urban issue. The communities that are able to have these types of ordinances look to increase the minimum wage, and it's at the cost to the rural communities, in our opinion. The second point I'd like to make is, you know, yesterday you heard from Aaron Collins from Haven's Candies. Havens is based in Westbrook. They have locations in Scarborough and Portland. And they've told us that they're concerned about 
Portland enacting their own minimum wage. Not because they pay minimum wage, they don't. But they don't pay the 10.68 or the $15 an hour that's being proposed there. And they have employees that work at multiple locations. And so going back to what Mrs. Rabinowitz said, it's the confusion of how do you actually manage those wages being a small main base company. Um, and the third question, or really a question for you folks to ask, is if we're going to allow um, a municipality to enact a minimum wage that's actually higher than what the state level is, can a municipality actually enact a, an ordinance that's lower than the state minimum wage as well? And I think that's a consideration to um, take under consideration. Um, and I guess I'll anticipate your question, Representative Fecto. Um, we did oppose the bills, um, the eight different bills, primarily on the basis that many of them had indexing which is one of the things that we've always opposed, which is why we appreciate having this conversation. We believe this is the conversation you should be having at the state level. So I'll stop there, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Representative Gilbert. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think that an answer to the question is can a municipality lower the minimum wage? The minimum wage is set by law, and there is a law that governs that. Uh, we're not looking. We're not looking to. Uh, we're not looking to enforce the law. You are looking at creating a law, preventing municipalities from doing something. Right. My, There's my, no law that governs it. Right? My point was, if you didn't pass this law, could a municipality choose in Maine to have the, only the federal minimum wage and not the state minimum wage? Uh, I think. I think that that, that would go against what. Federal, what state law it is right now. Uh, but I do have a question. And uh, you mentioned that this would, I think you said it would help. Uh, no, you didn't use it.